Welcome back to the John Krasinski Show, the perfect place to get an update on the Timberwolves' always confusing and long, long-running long ownership saga. We will let John break down what's happening and what might happen here and what the timetable might be. We'll get into all kinds of other Timberwolves and basketball stuff as well. This is the John Krasinski Show, part of TalkNorth.com. This is our basketball show on the network. Uh, check out all the other shows, including John's work on the Viking Update Show. We're coming to you from the Aquarius Home Services Studios. We want to thank our many sponsors, starting with Princeton's Liquors in Maple Grove, True Vision Institute, TSR Injury Law, Head Flyer Brewing, and Shepherd Goods and Lamb Chops Clothing Line. Best way to listen to this show or any of the shows you like at talknorth.com. Please subscribe to your favorite podcast app. It's free. It's the easiest way to listen. Thanks to our producer, to Davide Russell, and uh, thanks to John for being here. John, uh, why don't you just start off on the ownership saga and where we are, where it's all going right now? Yeah, so we got into it a lot last week, Jim. Um, some of the details of what I've kind of been compiling and trying to kind of sketch out in terms of the the picture of the process that we're looking at. And we'll get into more of that here in this conversation. But we can just start out, first of all, with uh, some some details about the timing of the process. And it's been sort of uh, difficult to really kind of envision and 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 wrap my mind around exactly how long this process is going to take in terms of um you know just getting every getting all the three arbitrators together getting them to hear the arguments going over some of the testimony and the briefs that are going to be submitted and it's always been assumed that it was going to take at least most of the summer for this process to play out in my conversations over the last week, I think it's really more of a late fall timeline in terms of a resolution on this process. Um, I think that scheduling issues with all of the parties um, are, are kind of contributing to that, especially with three ar- the three arbitrators that have been chosen when they're available. Um, we're looking at a late fall type of a thing, which means that it could theoretically bleed into next season. Some in terms of like um, understanding who exactly is going to come out uh, ahead in this process. Um, and so I, I, if Wolves fans are understandably wondering about when this is going to come to fruition, I think it's even going to be longer than I initially anticipated. And I'll get kind of specific dates to everyone when I can. But looking at late, late fall, uh, the other thing that I think is important that uh, in terms of a real question to answer right now, um, that is new to me in those last couple of, uh, in this last week or so is when the arbitration panel hears the case and decide and makes a ruling on it, that is what I'm told is going to be it. There, that's the legally binding, um, outcome of the case. If the arbitration panel rules for Glenn Taylor, Glenn Taylor keeps the team. If the arbitration panel rules for Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez, Mark and Alex then are awarded the team essentially and get to go to the NBA for final league approval of their ownership group, including Mayor Bloomberg, including Eric Schmidt from Google. And they will go through the final process of being approved by the NBA so that they can take over. Um, also, it's a three person panel. And it's a two to one, it's a majority decision. It does not have to be unanimous. So uh, those, I think, are some nuts and bolts, little details that are just small nuggets, but certainly important to sketch out so uh, Wolf fans understand how this process is going to play out and how long it's going to take. We can also get into a little bit more of the details here in this conversation about the possibilities of moving, about the luxury tax, about other things. But just to start here, some semi-newsy items is the process will take a little bit longer than anticipated into the late fall, and that arbitration panel's ruling is legally binding. There's no kind of avenue for legal challenge of the ruling unless um, you can say that one or more of the arbitrators was compromised was was biased against it which no one expects to happen so that's just the the um, nuts and bolts of it that i've been able to put together here and again we've got a long time to wait before all of this plays out 
Yeah, I mean, this is the United States. You will never find a judge who's been compromised or biased. It's not no, ab- absolutely not. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be all clean. Absolutely. By the way, we're recording this via Zoom, which means I have to look at a video of myself as we're talking. <laughs> I just want to send out a, you know, closed circuit message to all the people working in TV in the Twin Cities. Your jobs are safe. <laughs> no fine. worries here. I'm not, yep. I don't really want your job, but even if I did, I'm not, I don't, I don't think I'm a TV material. I think we're going to be okay. John, John has, you know, he's, he's uh, John Krasinski too. Yes. Uh, he's going to be starring in a remake of The Office any day now. So he's fine, but I think I'm going to have to stick to audio only. Maybe even write a little bit. We'll see. Well, I think like, I think Zoom, uh, Zoom is perfect for us in terms of like you and I can see each other, but then once we get this out to the masses, they don't have to see either one of us. So right. this will be audio only. And so it's maybe good for us for our conversation, but for the rest of you, we will spare you my stubble and my disheveled hair and your lack of hair and, um, and pasty skin. It will, it will give Dot a blackmail material <laughs> and hopefully it won't use us against us. Um, that's right. So. We give us give us the timeline. Uh, that's probably the clearest picture I've had of how things are going to play out. Uh, and I'm going to ask this question knowing the answer is probably that you don't have an answer. But just to ask it, do you see either side having any kind of an advantage at this point? Well, I mean, that so that is the hardest part here, Jim, um, is sort of handicapping the race. Um, certainly, we have seen um, that. I think that for a lay person like myself, I'm not a legal analyst um, at all. One reason that I think one thing that is clear early on here is that not early on, but to, as, as this process has unfolded, I think that Mark Glory and Alex Rodriguez are certainly winning the public relations battle. Um, part of the reason that that is, is that they have a very sort of compelling message that can be delivered. Hey, we had this agreement. Um, this old guy is reneging on the agreement. We are, as they've said to the athletic and to many other people publicly, you know, a month ago or, you know, more now, um, when this first happened, we feel very betrayed by Glenn Taylor's decision to turn his back on this agreement. And I think that that certainly resonates with the public. They see that and they say, yeah, we, you know, we, you know, we understand where you're coming from, Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez. This looks like you guys are getting the short end of the stick. Uh, with Glenn Taylor, his argument for nullifying the agreement is going to be very much more in the weeds of the contract. And he is going to try to say that uh, Alex Rodriguez and Mark Laurie did not comply with all of the steps of the contract. He's going to kind of look into, you know, pages and pages and making sure and saying, well, they missed something here. It didn't go right, right here. They don't have this. They didn't get this in on time. And I think that that p- argument is going to be that there's all of these things that happen kind of death by a thousand cuts to allow me to escape from this deal that it turns out I don't really like anymore. Um, and, and so it is harder for someone to kind of follow through all of that logic and, and, and come to any, to that conclusion of, okay, I see exactly clearly what Glenn Taylor's position is here. Um, ultimately though, the public relations, battle is not going to be the one that decides this. It's going to be those arbitrators. Um, we at The Athletic did have a story from uh, my my colleague Mike Vorkanoff earlier on in the playoffs, and he spoke to uh, several legal experts about trying to interpret who is right in this situation. And there was some caution with which several of the experts weighed in, but most of them were 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 on the side of Rodriguez and Lori in terms of it looks like they have fulfilled as much of the obligation as is reasonable for them to expect. And that if they did miss anything, that it wasn't enough to cancel the deal entirely. 
Um, but what they made clear and what others have made clear is that ultimately this is going to come down to the three members of the arbitration panel and how they view it individually. And so it's really hard to predict how um, the, how those three individuals are going to look at this, what lens they're going to view it through and how they're going to, to, to make it happen. Um, you know, uh, when you talk to both sides of it, when you talk to Glenn Taylor's side, when you talk to the Lorraine Rodriguez side of things, I've talked to the lawyers from both sides and, and, um, and representation and all that. The, both sides remain very clear and confident in their positions that we are dug in. This is, there's not going to be any compromises. We are not going to get to any sort of, uh, position where, Hey, you know, if, if we can, can we meet in the middle somewhere? There is no meeting in the middle. Like both sides believe that they stick to their guns, that they're going to come out on the other end of this, um, you know, on, on the winning side. And I think that there is clearly a lot of mistrust and bitterness that is seeping into this now that is only going to propel both of them to push even harder, to go at each other with even more vigor and, and to, and to dig into their, uh, respective positions more. And so, um, you know, we, we will see how it all plays out. And, um, and I am not sure how that arbitration panel is going to rule. Um, you know, the, the, the fans, I think have weighed in pretty heavily on the Lori and Rodriguez side. And we will just kind of, you know, we'll see, you know, if the arbitrators are on that side or if they see clear legal arguments for Glenn Taylor's side that, that make it, that make it so, uh, they can say, you know what? Glenn Taylor is in the right here and he's going to retain possession, uh, of the franchise. It's, it's, it's hard to predict is that's a long winded way of saying, I really don't know how it's going to shake out. You're destroying my faith in the <laughs> negotiating powers of lasagna. Hey, well, that, that is one thing. Together. That's supposed to be all that matters. They had lasagna together. We know that. We know that um, the three arbitrators are neutral parties, so they will not be in Mankato having lasagna with Glenn and Becky Taylor. And that has sealed many a deal uh, in the past for the Taylors. I do not anticipate them also being at the Four Seasons downtown um, and, you know, with Lauren Rodriguez. So, uh, these are independent, neutral people. There are two people from Minneapolis, from the Minneapolis area. One person is from out east, Jersey, Delaware, somewhere in there. And I'm, I'll, 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 wealth. yeah, maybe a wealth, maybe a wealth, but, a uh, wealth. yeah. yeah so, mind. so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be the two sides going at it and from, from two, from three, very neutral, very third party people that will not be swayed by lasagna, by sushi, by anything that that is put in front of them that way. Mm, right. The lasagna still might win the day. Uh, and Kevin Garnett is not one of the arbitrators, correct? Kevin Garnett is not one of the arbitrators, which is good for Glenn Taylor. Okay. Um, that That is for sure. Um, one of the other things that I did want to sort of circle back on is we had a discussion last week about kind of some of the ins and outs of the the process and you know when michael bloomberg was added to the um kind of i will say not he hasn't been technically added yet to the the ownership group he's going to buy in to to help buy out glenn taylor entirely if lorian rodriguez um qualify or win win in win an arbitration but his addition to their team certainly brought up even more questions from fans about the possibility of this team moving and does this make it you know more dangerous for the Timberwolves and their future in Minneapolis and Minnesota and and I went through it and you know I, I got some feedback from just some listeners about maybe you know believing that I was leaving a door open for this team to possibly move. And um, I, it, if that is the way it was interpreted, that is certainly not at all what I meant to say. Um, you know, even from the very first days of Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez joining this group, when there was a lot of very understandable skepticism or questioning about their motives, I kind of was have always been reporting that I did not see a, an outlet for this team to move, uh, given that you're going to expand to Seattle and Las Vegas, um, that 
the those are the two most desirable markets outside of Minneapolis. And 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 so not having either of those as carrots to dangle would be huge um, in this. I also know that the league likes being in Minneapolis and that it is a for for um contrary to some belief around the league, like this is a big market. It's a top half of the NBA market. And we saw this last postseason run, just how much support there is for NBA basketball in this community. So I don't think that there would be any appetite from the owners to move out of this market um, to, to, uh, to a different one. And finally, what we have seen from Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez since they have been here is that they have, you know, time and time again said, we're going to be in Minnesota for the long haul. Um, you have to take their word for it a little bit on that part of it. But uh, certainly the, the the evidence that I reported last week of them kind of doing a lot of work on a privately financed arena only cements more of that stance that they are in this for the long haul. And so I do not see any scenario happening here in, you know, in the next year or two, in the next five, 10 years, whatever it is that. Um, would allow the Timberwolves to move out of here just with all of those things kind of conspiring. The expansion in Seattle and Vegas, Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez looking for private financing for an arena or, or putting together private financing to build an arena and really everyone's stated desire to keep it here. I just think that the days of panicking about that should be over now. And I, and, and so just to be definitive on that point, I, I don't, I don't see a scenario where, where they're moving. I think they're here for the long time. But John, Minnesota fans know what happens. Red McCombs moved the Vikings to Texas. Yes, right. Wilfs moved the team to New Jersey. Donald Watkins bought the team Donald and went Watkins to Carolina. Donald Watkins bought the team and moved it to North Carolina. Carl Pollard, well, no, okay, I'll, I'll put her more diplomatically. Carl Pollard had a great deal waiting for him in North Carolina. Just didn't work out. Um, you know, so Minnesota teams never stay. I don't know why anybody would, would just assume this is going to happen here. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You know, like we get upset, I think, as Minnesotans, and I am one, so I can speak as a Minnesotan. You hear it in my accent. I've only been it's here right 35 there. years, so I'm yeah. not there yet. You're not there yet. You are not there yet. Um, but, I think that we get upset when New Yorkers, you know, Californians, people from Miami, from Chicago, wherever look and, and say, oh, Minnesota, small market, uh, who wants to live there? All of these things. But there's also like some sort of insecurity inside of us where first we're going to defend ourselves, say, no, 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 like this is a great place. But then it's also like, oh man, I hope they don't leave. Like, please don't, please don't leave us because it is really cold here. And, and so I think that there's a, a fence that Minnesota fans straddle sometimes. And look, they haven't had a whole lot of success to kind of, um, celebrate, uh, from their men's side of, of, of the, of the equation over the last 40 years. And so, um, there's just a, there's a neuroses that is here. And I would say, as I have said for a long, long time with this, with this group, uh, I, I just don't see, I just don't see them moving. So um, try and calm your body, and I hope this doesn't come back to bite me seven years from now. But um, but as a, as a, everything that I can put together, you can rest easy that this team is is here to stay for right now. Yeah, and I agree with you completely, and I'm glad you're saying it out loud too. It's important for us to establish that. Hey, we're overdue thanking our many sponsors. We're coming to you from the Aquarius Home Services Studios. Uh, Steve Terry from TSR Injury Law recently dropped by Princeton's Liquors to buy some stuff, spent a lot of money because he's a good dude, uh, and everyone should do the same. That's right. Uh, Princeton Liquors, Maple Grove, Bill Princeton and his family have been uh, kind of peddling uh, all sorts of high quality beverages for decades and decades. Uh, his grandfather goes all the way back to 1933, as soon as Prohibition flipped. They were opening their store and, and selling to everyone in the area. And if you go to Princeton Liquors, you're going to find a great selection of craft beer, not just some of the best selection in the metro area, but some of the best selection in the entire state. The bourbon is also a massive 
focus for Princeton's liquors and an unbelievable selection of bourbon if you're into that. And Steve Terry can attest. He, he sent us both a text message, Jim, um, the, the other night saying that they, he went in there and they had a, just a great selection and it was worth the trip to go check it out and, and, and get some. So if you're a bourbon aficionado, go in and check out Princeton's liquors. They also have THC seltzers and gummies. Now that those are legal, they have branched out into those areas. So really, if you need anything of that ilk, go on to Princeton's Liquors. Uh, Bill Princeton is a long, long time Timberwolves and Lynx fan. He interned for the Wolves and Lynx 2000, 2001 seasons, wore the Crunch mascot many times in the summer of 2001. So support the people who support your favorite teams and support us as a, as a show, as a weekly show. We thank Bill Princeton and Princeton's Liquors. For all their support, tell them John Krasinski and the John Krasinski Show sent you the next time you pop in. And you'll probably run into Steve Terry there. Uh, Steve, mm-hmm. just Steve's such a good guy. He goes out and supports our sponsors the way we always tell people to support him. So just, hey, we don't want you to need TSR Injury Law, but if you need that kind of help, they're the best. 612-TSR-TIME, 612-TSR-TIME. Nas Reed, Nas Reed. If they win, they will not charge you unless they win your case and they win lots of cases. That's why they get to hang around with Nas Reed. Uh, so thanks, Steve. We do appreciate it. Also time to hear more about True Vision Institute. True Vision Institute in Bloomington. I am currently in the True Vision Institute process of getting LASIK surgery. Went in there a few weeks ago during the playoffs and the good folks there really took me through a thorough a uh, friendly, easy to navigate process to get your eyes checked, go through a bunch of tests and examinations so they can find the right process for you to correct your vision, whether it's LASIK surgery, whether it's glasses and contacts, whether it's other kinds of procedures to help your vision. They have just really welcoming, friendly, super knowledgeable professionals who will get you to the right spot. And I went through that process, was really impressed by everything about it, never pressured to do anything, just presented me with a bunch of options, and we landed on LASIK surgery for me. I'm going to be going in a little bit later this summer after navigating um, a few family things and and, and and the early parts of the offseason here with the Timberwolves to get my surgery, and I will certainly be updating you as that goes along, but I'm very excited. Chew Vision Institute in Bloomington, chewvision.com to reach out and start scheduling an appointment just for a consultation. No um, no obligations or anything like that. They will get you set up to get looking at it. And uh, I, I couldn't recommend it higher. Chewvision.com. How do you see the luxury tax playing out this year with a very expensive team? Yeah, so, um, you know, another another subject to get into kind of stemming from the ownership situation. We touched on it last week. A little bit as well, but important to, I think, reiterate now that we are fully into the offseason, the finals are over. We can kind of really cast our gaze forward to how this team is going to operate coming off of a Western Conference finals. And one of the benefits of having a, an ownership tussle the way that the Wolves have. There's a lot of chaos to it. There's a lot of downsides to it. No question about the lack of clarity and what's going to happen. And uh, I feel really bad for a lot of people um, within the organization that are just kind of caught in the middle of this, trying to figure out how this is going to shake out and what what kind of effect it's going to have on them and their family. It's very, very difficult situation for a lot of really good employees over in the franchise. But if there is a bonus for fans in this situation it is that i believe both sides have pretty much dug in and committed to paying the luxury tax coming off of this season where there's a lot of discussion about you know could lori and rodriguez have to slash spending um to get below the luxury tax for any perceived financial issues um they have kind of made the communications behind the scenes to people within the franchise. This was, you know, several months ago um, before all this played out that uh, they're all in as a luxury tax kind of spending team, certainly adding Michael Bloomberg and Eric Schmidt and deep pockets like that will only fortify 
that position. Um, and Glenn Taylor has also uh, told people within the team, I'm told that they're, yeah, they're in for the luxury tax. Um, you know, I don't think either side wants to be portrayed as cheap or miserly or anything like that. If you're trying to, uh, to, to give the message that no, our ownership group is the best one to lead this team into the future, any team, e- either side looking to cut spending would be a huge detriment to making that case. And so, uh, both sides are all in on that process for next season and any decisions, whether it is to trade Carl Anthony Towns or any of their other key players on this rotation, if they make that trade, I'm not eliminating the possibility of making a trade like that, but I can say with confidence that if they do make a trade, it will be for basketball reasons for trying to make the team more competitive, better suited to try and um, make the final step from conference finalist to NBA finals. And it won't be for luxury tax purposes, for financial purposes. Glenn Taylor has told his, uh, his front office that, hey, I'm in this thing. Um, I'm ready to pay. I really enjoyed last season and I think we're close. Let's push forward and, and, and do what we have to do to make this team as competitive as possible. I know that, um, the front office can also operate under the impression that should Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez win this case later this year, that they are fully comfortable paying the luxury tax, that they're ready to be aggressive and go all in on this team and win as much as possible right now while Anthony Edwards' window was just opening, while you still have Rudy Gobert and Mike Conley being very effective even later in their careers. They know that the time is now to go for it. So the money is going to be spent. Now, what will be interesting to see going forward is in this new collective bargaining agreement, I think any ownership group can confidently commit to a year or two of luxury tax spending before we start to get into these second apron roster building restrictions, steeper, more penalty, uh, more, um, uh, how, what's the word? Steeper, more, um, yeah, more, more, more serious, uh, financial, uh, ramifications for exceeding the luxury tax in a way that the wolves will have to exceed it to remain competitive. And so then you look at, okay, will Glenn Taylor and Becky Taylor want to pay the luxury tax for the next three, four, five, six years, um, of this with, you know, um, versus will Alex Rodriguez and Mark Laurie and Michael Bloomberg and Eric Schmidt, you know, how, how deep are they going to go into it? Um, those are questions for maybe, um, you know, down the road, certainly to see how this plays out. But I think that is where adding as much financial, um, deep pocketed help as you can to your ownership group can pay dividends for the long term of this. But in the immediate future, right now, which is, I think, what most Wolves fans are, are caring about in, in, in the present, um, both sides are are all in on next year playing that luxury tax and doing what it takes to to get this team going um, for one more step into the finals. Let's take a first look at the draft and a last look at the NBA finals first, though. Let's hear more about Head Flyer Brewing. Head Flyer Brewing Northeast Minneapolis been telling you about it for a long time now, which is fun because we have been in business together with Neil, with Nate, with Megan, with all the good folks at Head Flyer. Um, for a couple of seasons now. And I, you know, the longer that we are kind of paired together, the more we've gotten to know each other and the even stronger I feel about speaking in very positive terms about what Head Flyer is, both as a, as a business, as a brewery, and just as the people behind the scenes trying to put out a good product. Number one, first and foremost, the thing that got my wife and I into Head Flyer years ago was they have great beer. They have all sorts of wide selection of beers um, to, to drink and and to, to have a good time. We've done the Crunch Time collaboration with them for a couple years in a row. But any kind of, of beer that, that you could ask for, go into Head Flyer, 
and and you can grab it. Uh, they also have the THC seltzers. Uh, it, 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 they're they're into that as well. Um, many options there. They have great merchandise. Their patio and their um, wide open tap room super friendly for customers to go in and hang out. Now that we're getting good weather, when it's not raining. Go into Head Flyer Brewing, hang out, have yourself a beer, bring your dog, bring your friends, bring your coworkers. And again, tell them the John Krasinski Show sent you. Buy some of their awesome merchandise and have some great beers. Head Flyer Brewing, Northeast Minneapolis. And I also want to thank, John wants to thank, Shepherd Goods and Lamb Chops Clothing Line. SGLambchops.com is the place to go for Shepherd Goods and Lamb Chops Clothing Line. Uh, just super comfortable, stylish wear uh wear sweatpants hoodies t-shirts the best shorts i've ever owned um hats anything that you could want to look cool and 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 feel good uh, it goes to uh, sglambchops.com go there put in the promo code jonk20 for 20 percent off anything that you order at shepherd goods and lamb chops clothing and at the end of this program we will answer a Twitter question and whoever gets chosen will get a free pair of those shorts. So this is, uh, lamb chops really kind of stepping up and, and putting their product where their mouth is, letting, uh, Wolves fans really, uh, enjoy some of the, the great stuff that they have. But I can't speak highly enough about Craig, about Jordan, about all the people there, about the work that they've done. You've seen them sitting courtside at Timberwolves and Lynx games. They are a part of this community. Um, and they make high quality, very affordable, comfortable active wear to wear on a night on the town to wear while you're lounging around at home sglambchops.com with the promo code j-o-n-k-20 for 20 percent off any uh, off your purchase uh just go there check it out you won't be sorry so we really haven't talked much about the draft we've been busy with other things uh what this you know the wolves do have a personnel director in tim Connolly who is known to surprise us uh what do you expect from this draft and Tim's actions in the next few weeks. Yeah, well, I mean, here's first and foremost, here's the best news is that the Wolves do have a pick. Um, oh, you know, with the I Rudy Gobert trade. For a while. <laughs> with the Rudy Gobert trade, they have certainly um, you know, sacrificed a lot of their future picks to bring in a player of his regard. And I think, you know, the the deal worked out incredibly well this season to get them to the conference finals for the first time in 20 years. But um, they also now can back that up by going back into the draft and they have picks at 27 and 37. It is a weak draft. Okay. So there's not, um, a, a lot of high end talent at the top of the draft to be really excited about. But I do think that Tim Connolly, Matt Lloyd, Del Demps you can put Sachin Gupta in there. You could put a lot of their. Their scouts, John Wallace, um, a lot of the people that they have in their front office come in with both a history of and a mandate to maximize the return on lower picks, second round picks, um, late first round picks, which is where you hope to be drafting when you put together a team like this with Anthony Edwards, with Cat with Rudy, with uh, Jane McDaniels, with everyone involved here. And so they go into this with real needs right now. We talked about the luxury tax, of course, and we, and even though you can have ownership committed to paying that tax, you still need to supplement your roster with cheap young talent to fill in the back end of it because even, for example, the Warriors – who are printing money at Chase Center, who have sold out every game forever, who had deep playoff runs on their ledgers to generate huge revenue. Uh, they had to make some, some decisions over the past year to kind of start to address their enormous luxury tax bills. And so it doesn't matter how deep your pockets are. Some, at some point, the collective bargaining agreement is designed to put pressure on that and make you make some hard choices. So going down and getting players who maybe they're not starters for you necessarily, but are rotation level guys to help when, let's say, a Kyle Anderson may leave in free agency. Let's say a Monte Morris leaves. 
in free agency or Jordan McLaughlin. They are going to need to get players to come in and and help them at positions of need. Number one is point guard. They do have to find somebody who can be at least a possibility for them to take to take the baton from Mike Conley. Um, they also really need, as we saw in the Dallas series, another wing, another good three point shooting, defensive minded, you know, two, three who can come in and give them good minutes. And I think they were one player short against Dallas, whereas Boston was not, uh, was, was not a player short and that made all the difference in the world. So we're starting to see them have workouts at Mayo Clinic Square. Um, I, I continue to believe that it would be incredible if somehow Marquette point guard Tyler Collect fell to them at 27. I do not anticipate that happening, but I think they're going to look heavy at point guard. So another mock draft, Kevin O'Connor, who does a great job at the ringer, um, forecast KJ Simpson from Colorado, kind of a, a really good shooter. Um, and, and, you know, who can, who can do a lot of things could probably be a combo guard for you, um, or, or a point guard. That's another, another name to watch. There's going to be several others that come up, uh, throughout this, but the Wolves are going to go into this draft in 10 days from now with real needs and kind of needing sneakily to get someone that can help in that rotation. So it will be very interesting to see how they navigate 27 and 37. Do they use it to trade? Um, do they pick somebody that they like and can they get someone in who can be of help immediately to a team that is going to have designs on playing deep into May and hopefully into June? Another topic we'll be hitting on this summer is just what does the back end of the, the Wolves roster and bench look like uh, even before and after the draft or any, the, any of the current players have a chance of helping out. Uh, there's always so much to talk about during the summer. Sometimes the off-season shows are better than the regular season shows. But you don't, you're not worried about just the result of the last game. You can talk more philosophically. Uh, one more topic for today. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Thank you for listening. Again, thanks to Davide for producing. Uh, and those are kind of lousy finals. The Celtics just yeah. did what they wanted. Yeah, it, it was unfortunate. I really did think, Jim, I was surprised, actually. And maybe I was colored by the way that Dallas really handled the Wolves in their series, um, that I just thought it was going to be a very long series. And I thought Dallas could even win the series. I really mm-hmm. did. Um, and what, it, you know, what we saw is kind of what we saw in reverse in the Western Conference finals is that the playoffs are a matchup driven operation. And, um, I think the Boston Celtics are really good. First of all, clearly they are, they have been, they were and are the best team in the NBA. They were that all season long. All through the playoffs, they just, they, they backed everything up and had an unbelievable run. Now you can discount some of the, you know, uh, injuries that benefited them on their Eastern Conference foes, um, with Giannis, with Joe Embiid, with, with a bunch of people in the East. You can, you can discount the fact that they played in the Eastern Conference and maybe were, were able to pad their win total because the East is not as good as the Western Conference. Um, but, I just think that they answered every question that they needed to answer. And I expected the Mavericks to put up a much bigger fight uh, in this series. And I thought that they had the weapons to counteract some of what Boston could do. But what we saw is what Boston has that Minnesota did not is number one, they had five guys offensively that could really hurt you. So there was nowhere for Dallas to hide Luca or Kyrie and Luca, especially early in the series, got torched defensively, just absolutely torched. And then secondly, I do think that they had a little bit more maturity in their perimeter defensive players. I'm talking about physical maturity with Tatum, with Brown, with Derek White, with Drew Holiday. They're all 25, 26, 27, 28 years old or older. And and have been through the wars a little bit and could physically stand up to Luca and physically stay in front of Kyrie in a way that the less mature Wolves perimeter defenders, Ant, Jaden, even Nikhil Alexander Walker were not able to do. And so it did really kind of further emphasize some of the 
shortcomings that the Wolves are going to have to address, either through internal development or through changes from draft, trades, free agency, that sort of thing. Uh, the Wolves are still a step away from being a team ready to compete for a championship like that. Um, and, and I think Boston really did show that. But yes, I was disappointed overall that the, that the series was as lopsided as it was and that the Mavericks couldn't find a way to sort of counteract what the Celtics were doing, except for just one game when the Celtics really weren't even mentally into it. Good stuff from John. Thanks for explaining all the ownership stuff. We'll keep everybody updated. We appreciate all of our sponsors. We appreciate all of our listeners. Thanks for listening to TalkNorth.com. Remember to subscribe, and we'll talk to you next week. Hey, and Jim, one more time. Uh, we got a Twitter, Twitter question. question. Give me the Twitter yeah. question. SGLambchops.com, J-O-N-K-20 for 20% off there. It comes from Derek E. Sullivan. Do you think this one of the stipulations of Tim Connolly had when he agreed to push his out opt out until next year was that Glenn Taylor agrees to not veto deals. Taylor has been very public with his desire to run it back and t- Tim Connolly might not be so inclined. And what I would say, Derek, to that is I don't think that there was any sort of agreement reached in terms of Glenn saying, I will stay out of the way and you can do whatever you want. It's He's still going to have to sign off on any big trade. But I do think that it is agreed upon that any moves that are made, as indicated earlier in the show, are to make the team better. And so if you do want to trade, let's say Cat, for instance, which I think Glenn would prefer Carl Anthony Towns to stay around, I actually think that that's probably the likely scenario with uh, for Tim Connolly as well, just in terms of what is going to be available to make a deal. Um but if they, if they, they, as they explore their options, it will be, if you trade cat, it has to make the team better for next season. And, 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 it, you know, there's not going to be any kind of thing of you have to trade him or you have, you have to hold the fort just to bring all of these guys back. If there is an avenue that Tim Connolly sees, to make the team more competitive, I believe that Glenn Taylor will sign off on that. Uh, I, you know, I believe that Tim Conley would see, get the same sort of support from Mark Lorinox Rodriguez as well. If they eventually inherit this team, they would be great with an aggressive approach like that to competitiveness, not to uh, financial per string pulling and tugging. So um, long, long way to answer it, but. Uh, no, I don't think that there were any sort of stipulations put into the deal because I think they're on the same page in that regard. And they'll go forward trying to make deals to make this team better for next season and no other reason. Good stuff, John. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We do appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon.